Uh, I think it's time to get started. Uh, I think we're uh, really very fortunate that uh, our dean uh, has uh, written extensively on uh, informed consent and clinical trials and randomization of clinical trials and uh, has done a great deal to educate us uh, about the importance of uh, randomization in clinical trials, the evaluation of studies that we read in the literature, and has helped improve our critique in evaluating articles that we read. And uh, we're particularly fortunate uh, that he's here today to uh, discuss the topic of uh, informed consent and randomized clinical trials uh, in medicine. I don't know that I didn't like the sound of that particularly fortunate that I'm here today. I'm here every day. <laughs> <laughs> the topic uh, that I chose it may seem a little obscure to you and, and won't be clarified until the latter 10 or 15 minutes of the presentation. And some of the material I'm going to present may have been seen by some of you before, but, but it's necessary for background uh, information. But I do want to develop a theme and uh, present you with a problem. And uh, uh, the theme I want to present is, is the uh, documentation of the importance of randomization in studies of therapeutic uh, benefit. And the problem uh, lies in the fact that it's becoming increasingly harder to uh, interest both physicians and patients in participating in, in randomized controlled trials, even as the need becomes ever greater. Now, I will begin with a little history, and uh, my interest in the subject began way back, uh, 1950, when I used to keep every patient with acute viral hepatitis in bed, and by doing a randomized study based on historical trials and after a randomized study began to let them up. And in the early 50s uh, or, or late 40s when I used to stuff every patient with cirrhosis full of protein and thought when they died that it was uh, inadequate therapy rather than the wrong therapy. In other words, not enough protein. And it wasn't until encephalopathy, relationship of encephalopathy to protein was discovered that we discovered it was the wrong thing. But it was based on very good historical trials. And finally, uh, portocable shunt surgery, if I can have the first slide, the decision by most physicians to shunt patients when they had bleeding varices was based primarily on a paper by Linton et al. from the great Massachusetts General Hospital in which they showed the survival of patients treated by Dr. Linton and the survival of a control group which collected by Dr. Oscar Ratnoff in New York hospitals. And, uh, uh, I think it's on the basis of this kind of data that many thousands of people had portocable shunt surgery performed in the 50s, 60s, and, and 70s. But there was a randomized, there were three randomized controlled trials done, uh, in this case of prophylactic shunting, but uh, the, uh, the results on therapeutic shunting are not significantly different. And this is a combination of the three trials uh, in which the patients were randomized to uh, either a control group or a shunt group. And in this area, the difference was statistically significant in survival, but it favored the controls rather than the shunt group. And the explanation for this lies in the next slide, which are data from the Boston Interhospital Liver Group, in which the, there were two control groups. There was a group of patients with the disease who were considered for the study and a group of patients with the disease who were randomized. And as you can see, there's no difference between the surgical or medical treatment, but a big difference with the control group. And that led to the conclusion, the obvious conclusion, that if you have varices and want to live a long time, the thing to do is to be selected for portocable shunt surgery but not have it. Now, recently, and uh, here I'd like to emphasize some thanks to an awful lot of people, we've had a program of of gathering data from the literature to examine uh, the quality of randomized controlled trials and the interpretation and results as compared with the 
uh, data that might be learned from historical and, and current practice. This has been supported by the National Library of Medicine. We've had a, uh, Dr. Henry Sachs and Harry Smith have, have helped me. Uh, and we've had uh, the good fortune of a, of a gimmick for getting an awful lot of work done uh, in that we've had a, an elective course uh, meets Friday afternoons attended by a few first or second year medical students in experimental design biostatistics and then the summer program in which the students who attend during the year uh, and others work on library projects uh, related to analyzing the results of clinical trials and various other uh, related topics. And uh, we've been very successful in that the, the students have submitted their summer reports to uh, national meetings. And last year we got seven out of eight uh, on the program. And this year we've heard from three, all, from four already, and three have been accepted. So it's turned out to be an, an, a mechanism for educating ourselves and the students and in, in the how to tell what a good trial is. And uh, uh, it's uh, made us all realize that the library has an enormous amount of information which is not tapped the way it should be. As, and this is getting increasingly worse as more and more data are filed away in studies that, that uh, become forgotten and often can't be, even be picked up by Medline. So the results of one of these analyses in portocable shunt surgery that, that Dr. Sachs has done, as this will be published in the American Journal of Medicine, I think, in the next month or two, is to look at a number of uh, studies of patients with cirrhosis who have esophageal varices who receive some form of long-term therapy, usually surgery versus medical, or a shunt, in this case, shunt versus medical uh, therapy. And here we've distinguished between the shunt patients as a solid line uh, and the control patients as a dotted line and the randomized trials as a solid dot up here and the historical trials as a uh, triangle so that you can see that the historical control patients do very badly, but that the shunted patients that are selected from historical controls do about the same or maybe even a little worse than the randomized patients, whether they have shunting or not. So it's the same as the, as the bilge data, showing that the, the, uh, it's the selection of the patients for shunt rather than the shunting that seems to make the difference. This same applies to a certain extent to uh, coronary artery surgery and survival. <clears throat> These are data uh, from a single study done at the Cleveland Clinic in which the, the surgical therapy, here the historical controlled surgical therapy dotted line has an excellent survival in three years and the uh, medical controls have a terrible survival. And then the VA cooperative trial of portocable shunt surgery is stuck in here, in which there was a little benefit for uh, surgery, uh, but uh, not, uh, it's, it finally has become statistically significant after five years. Now, these were total patients in the group, and there'd been a lot of uh, comment that the VA study was, was dealing with more severe patients and or less severe patients and that their operative mortality was too high and, and uh, uh, but a, an examination of the data from the Cleveland Clinic and the VA study with correction for survival according to whether the patients had one, two or three vessel disease, disease resulted in the same picture you've seen in the previous slides, namely that the medical control, historical control group did badly and the uh, surgical, in this case the, the VA uh, surgical patients were just about identical, almost identical, with the, the um, Cleveland Clinic surgical patients, just a little bit, bit worse. So again, the, the, the selection of patients for the, at the Cleveland Clinic seems to be more pertinent than the, the, uh, uh, than the operation on survival. These are data that when they were shown once in San Francisco, Ma Alvin Feinstein was chairing the meeting. And he said the, the obvious conclusion from this was that if you did have coronary artery disease and it bothered you and you happened to live in Cleveland uh, while you, or somewhere else, the thing to do if you want medical therapy is to stay away from the uh, Cleveland Clinic. Now the, the data, a similar kind of data, are uh, uh, from 
a study of, of adjuvant, that now I'm getting away from the surgical comparisons, adjuvant immunotherapy for malignant melanoma. In this case, the number of trials are, are less, but we have a historically, uh, we have a treated group compared with two different historical controls, one from the institution in which the investigators were working and one from another institution with a massive difference, marked difference. And then uh, that same institution took part in a randomized controlled trial of patients, uh, and here again the, the outcome of immunotherapy was, was identical uh, with randomization and marked no matter what kind of control group one used, what kind of historical control group one used. This is a uh, diethyl stilbestrol for habitual abortion, old stuff, because all these studies were done uh, in the early 1950s. But there were three randomized trials with 2,000 patients, and the mean percent of live babies was 87 and 87 for a difference, no difference. Non-random but simultaneous alternate cases, uh, again, pretty much the same, except actually the placebo did better than the, um, than the stilbestrol treated uh, women. And, uh, but historical controls, unmatched, 29% uh, difference, difference of 29% in the mean percent of live babies favoring stilbestrol. Historical controls matched, it was even greater, 37%, and then one retro, one study in which both the controls and the treated were retrospective was 16%. Uh, again, uh, and, and yet it was on the basis of these historically controlled studies rather than the randomized controlled studies that uh, well over probably several, several million uh, pregnant women received massive doses of stilbestrol until 1971 when the relationship to carcinoma of the vagina was first described. Summarizing uh, these data, we have uh, five different areas in which we're giving the, the randomized controlled trials and uh, the historically matched and historically unmatched controlled trials. And uh, as can be seen, that these are the total numbers of studies. And if we just look down here, we have the, the percent favoring treatment, 16% uh, in randomized, 87% in the matched, and 76% in the unmatched. And the, the, uh, uh, the differences are, are uh, distinct and, and, and striking. Now, why does this happen? Um, well, I think even in, in the, uh, I, I think it's clear that, that, uh, that there's, especially in chronic diseases, there's more influence of the state of the patient than the therapy. But it's important to look at the all different kinds of assignment because it's possible that some, uh, that one doesn't have to be quite so elaborate as use blind randomization maybe just simple flipping of a coin or alternate cases would be enough. So uh, one of our medical students, Paul Solano, uh, did a summer project in which he looked at uh, all of the random, all of the controlled trials that he could find uh, in which therapy was tested in the treatment of acute myocardial infarction, chosen because the endpoint was death and therefore non-arguable and because the, the duration was only about three weeks of each study and therefore they were more combinable, so that they were all sorts of different therapies tested for uh, myocardial infarction. And blinded randomization was defined as the patient assignment determined from opaque envelope, telephone call, or prearranged bottled medication after consent obtained, unblinded randomization from open table of random numbers, date of birth, chart number, or some other relatively random system by which the physician could he, he might not, but he could know the treatment assignment when he selects the patient and obtains consent. Simultaneous selected controls, patients assigned to treatment by method more susceptible to clinical judgment than trance, treated by the same or different physicians. Some of these were patients treated in, in coronary care units compared with those treated out on the wards and uh, related kinds of, of phenomena. And then finally, the historical controls in which patients were selected from hospital charts or from reports in the literature or computerized databases, sometimes matched by prognostic risk criteria, variably susceptible to bias. These are diagrammed now in, in here in that if a patient under blinded randomization is considered suitable for a study, uh, one then ob obtains informed consent. 
And that informed consent is obtained without knowledge of the therapy, and the patient has to have explained to them that, that the doctor doesn't know how they're going to be treated and, uh, until uh, after he gets their consent to be treated either way. And that does add a difficulty because some patients drop out when they get the treatment they didn't prefer. But at any rate, after the patient says yes, then the patient is randomized and gets treatment A or treatment B, and the one who says no is out. Unblind randomization starts off with the randomization because that's when the doctor has a peek at what's up next. If, in other words, if he knows that the, the odd days of the month or can have a peak. He knows the odd days of the month get treatment A and the even days get treatment B, or if it's alternate cases, or if it's a system of randomization in which they're randomized in pairs so that the first one may be at random, but then you know what the next one is uh, if it's to be matched and if the study is not uh, perfectly blind. If the study is absolutely beautifully blinded so there's no suspicion of what's being received, then, then it falls up in the blinded randomization group. So you know it's whether treatment A or B is going to get this patient when you select. The patient's going to get either A or B when they're selected. Then informed consent is requested with the knowledge of the treatment and the patient is out or in. And then uh, those who say yes to the informed consent get treatment A or B as a sign back here and those who say no are out. Now Marvin Zellen has devised and reported in the New England Journal of Medicine a modification of this which is a, attempts to be more ethical by only uh, doing the decision afterwards in those cases in which the therapy is different from the standard, so that one asks for informed consent for the new therapy but not for the standard therapy and doesn't ask until after the, the decision has been made, or the randomization has been assigned. The trouble with this sort of thing, is the theoretical trouble with it, is that uh, although one might try very hard to be uh, objective and critical and obey the standards in the study uh, with regard to selection and rejection of patients, there are always little nuances which may affect the judgment of the doctor in his decision as to whether the patient is suitable or not, but even more important than that are the nuances which affect how vigorously he, he or she attempts to get informed consent. And one can imagine that, that uh, in this case, if treatment A, the, the uh, patient is selected, the doctor has a suspicion, and it need not be definite, that that is treatment A, and treatment A is something which the doctor is enthusiastic about, he can get the informed consent, because I think doctors can get informed consent from their patients if they know them well for almost anything. But on the other hand, if the doctor doesn't like treatment B, and that's the one that's up, and the patient says no, instead of pursuing the question as he might if, if it were A, and he thought the patient would do well with it, he lets it drop and that patient is out of the study and that means that it's no longer a randomized controlled trial and the patients who get treatment A are not similar to treatment B at the beginning, theoretically. Now the question is, can we document that? Does it, does it ever happen? And that's what Dr. Solano, Mr. Oh, now Dr. Solano was doing. These are the simultaneous and, his, and historical controls, patient selected, informed consent requested, uh, yes, get treatment A experimental, uh, no, they're out and then some other control group is dug up. Or patient treated with B selected and rarely matched, informed consent not necessary is the, is the control. And this is the critical issue here, which makes these patients very different from these. In that historical controlled patients have never given their informed consent for a new and possibly dangerous or interesting therapy, and therefore they are bound to be, on the average, somewhat different from those patients that are selected and then uh, do give their consent. And that's the reason why historical and simultaneous controls could result in different uh, kinds of results from the trials. Now let's look at the results, and uh, <coughs> here they are. Uh, this is the case fatality rate, uh, the mean, in the control group, in the treated group, and the difference. And these are the blind randomization patients, studies in which 10% of the studies had a p-value of less than 0.05. And for unblind randomization, it was 25%. Uh, mind you that even though it was a random selection, but it was done quite often with knowledge of the treatment, and here it was 25% of the studies were positive, and for simultaneous control, 65, and historical control, 65. And quantitatively, the difference for the randomized trials was 
0.008 in mean case fatality rate in the hospital. For unblind randomization, it was twice that. The difference was twice that. And for simultaneous, it was three times that. And, and for historical controls, the difference was three times on the average between control and treatment. Now, this, this, uh, some of the studies favored control and some favored treatment. Now, Solano also uh, extracted from every paper the data on the pre-treatment, pre-randomization, pre-treatment assignment status. Uh, these were not consistently given. They were highly variable. It would have been nice to have more data, but he did find an appreciable amount, and he uh, recorded all of the prognostic variables that he could find in all of these studies. And uh, we'll see of the 51 blind ran blindly randomized studies, he found 225 variables and with a mean variable per study of 4.41. And for the unblind randomization, there were less variables, 3.64 per study, and for the non-random, 3.19. So that the, there are more data given for the randomized trials, which also, incidentally, are later in date. And uh, the percentage with, of the studies with P less than 0.05 of the, of the prognostic variables altogether, 3.5 percent of the 51 blind randomized studies had at least one prognostic variable that was significantly different at the 5 percent level between the treatment and the control group. You might expect about 5 percent by definition. But in the unblind randomization, it's 8.8 percent, and in the non-random, combining the simultaneous and historical, there are 32 percent of the uh, prognostic variables tested are different, suggesting that the larger differences in the non-blind random studies could, not necessarily were, but could have been equally explained by maldistribution of the patients due to the process of randomization as they were uh, by the differences in the therapies. This, as far as we know, is the only time that this phenomenon has been, has been documented, although it's been suspected and it's certainly taught in the in the uh, statistical textbooks that one should be as meticulous as possible with the randomization process. Now, the third, uh, uh, or, the, or rather the, the next and, and major point, which evolves from the, the uh, need for, uh, and emphasizes the need for more randomized trials, is a look at how decisions are made uh, in medicine uh, with regard to the knowledge gained from randomized trials and, and from others. And we got onto this uh, idea that there may be some bias in the decision about how to treat patients uh, from the responses in the New England Journal of Medicine to the VA study of coronary artery surgery. And we recorded all of the mailed responses, and we found that, that uh, uh, in, there were a total of 23 letters written either to the journal or, or one or two other journals in which nine cardiovascular surgeons all thought the study was terrible, and of 14 others, it was split 50-50, uh, a significant difference and therefore a relationship between opinions about the conclusion of the study and the way in which the writer was uh, trained or educated or, or, or made his living. Now. <coughs> The, the process of obtaining informed consent for randomized controlled trials is very elaborate, as you're aware, and uh, the uh, people who want to do such a study have to write out an extensive protocol, present it to a peer review committee, uh, argue with the committee about various ethical aspects, and finally get a protocol which is satisfactory to the committee, and, uh, and then the study gets going and the patient is given a one, two, or four-page document to read and sign in some places and or have it described to him with all the terrible things that might happen to him if, if he joins the study and then is expected to join. And, uh, and this is done for the specific purpose of controlling the possible bias of the investigator. Uh, ten years or so ago, uh, when this system was very informal, it was discovered that there were a few clinical trials going on in which some doctors, which it looked as though the doctors might have been putting patients into the clinical trials for their personal gain. And it was thought in Congress and elsewhere that 
since personal gain may be involved in the decision about whether or not to do a study, uh, we have to control that to be sure that the patient is not a guinea pig and to be sure that the doctor doesn't talk the patient into going into the study for the doctor's gain rather than the patient's gain. And therefore, uh, the rigmarole or the processes were set up to protect the patient from the possible uh, decisions by the doctor which might be biased for their, because of their ambition to do research rather than take care of the patients. But this phenomenon sort of gave us the idea that maybe there was evidence in the literature that doctors entering patients into therapy that's not part of a trial may have the same personal gain, be it conscious or unconscious, and I think everybody assumed it was, it was uh, unconscious in the case of research. Unconscious, uh, I mean, bias being by definition unconscious. And if so, why then, why not have informed consent and protocols for uh, other forms of therapy and why such a drastic difference between research and, and practice. So for the last three or four years now, we've been looking uh, when we could at various examples in the literature to see whether there's evidence of decision making by physicians based on their personal gain rather than the uh, good of the patient. It's hard to tell how doctors make their decisions, um, and it's impossible really in individual cases, so that the only way we could get some data which might be meaningful was to look at what doctors say should be done. In other words, to look at review articles. In order to control our own biases, we had the review articles Xeroxed so that when we looked at the opinion, we didn't know what journal it came from or what kind of a doctor was writing the opinion. And when we looked at the authors of the article, we didn't know what uh, their training or, or uh, specialty was. And we did every single one in, in either duplicate or triplicate. Uh, and when there were differences of opinion about the opinions, uh, we sat down and, and resolved them uh, reasonably satisfactorily. Uh, and the results of all these studies are summarized in the next few slides. Uh, when the uh, patients, when the articles giving an opinion about coronary artery surgery were got together and we found a tremendous number, uh, we found 57 written by cardiovascular surgeons and 76 written by others. And we found that we had to divide the, the uh, response into survival, uh, whether it was good for survival for symptoms or then we, the ones that didn't distinguish between survival and symptoms we call general. And we found that 58% that, uh, of, the, of the surgeons were enthusiastic for survival, 100% as far as control of symptoms are concerned, and 85% in general enthusiastic for doing surgery, whereas the non-surgeons had 29% 56 percent and 23 uh, percent, significantly lower. When we then reanalyzed uh, these data to identify, uh, to separate the others into those who worked in institutions that had large volumes of coronary artery surgery, in other words, institutions that, that could be conceived of as depending on a lot of coronary artery surgery for uh, income, we found the same split, that those uh, non-surgeons who came from busy operating places, and you might expect it, were all in favor of surgery and thought it did wonderful things with regard to survival symptoms and in general, whereas the non-surgeons who came from places that we couldn't find similar, we couldn't find articles reporting large series of coronary artery surgery from those institutions were significantly less enthusiastic about the operation. Same principle applies to porticable shunt surgery, although here the differences are not so striking, but it is significant at the 5 percent level that the surgeons in general think patients should be operated on and the medical people not. In bleeding peptic ulcer, uh, the same uh, conclusion, some 81 articles reviewing uh, the therapy for bleeding ulcer, and here again the surgeons are in favor of aggressive therapy, 25, 22 in favor of equivocal, 8 for conservative and the others, the, di the direction is reversed, three for aggressive, 10 for equivocal, equivocal about it, and 13 conservative. Again, a, a significant distribution, as one might expect. Dr. Elishoff uh, of Los Angeles has gathered similar kinds of data in which she sent out a questionnaire, sent out uh, uh, a case history, and um, asked uh, doctors at what level of bleeding they would intervene with surgery. And she found that 45 percent of the surgeons would intervene at two pints of blood 
and that 60% at four pints and 75% and at six pints, and the gastroenterologists were way down there, well underneath, very conservative. And one wonders here with, with regard to the informed consent for operating. Is this something the patient should have in mind when, when giving consent from, to the surgeon, that surgeons in general uh, are pretty well demonstrated to operate more quickly, uh, an obvious statement. Uh, the, uh, she also did it by age of, the, by duration of ulcer disease and uh, found exactly the same criteria uh, that, that the uh, uh, average across the number of units that peop those people were more inclined to operate on older patients, on patients with longer disease, than the surgeons more so than the, than the interns. Uh, the data on carcinoma of the breast are interesting. Here are our randomized trials. Uh, done oh, way back as early as 1955 of patients given radiotherapy for after radical mastectomy as prophylactic therapy and controls, and uh, I guess 59 is the first paper. And these are randomized trials, and these are the contrived control trials. These are variable in both directions, as one might imagine, because sometimes you might be more inclined to give radiotherapy to the patients who are more likely to have metastases, and sometimes you might give them to those that had less because you wanted to vigorously prevent them. But I think, again, the randomized ones are the only ones of use, and there is no difference in either stage one or stage two in survival. And there are now a couple more trials have been done which show this same, same trend, although there is a difference in patients who have lumpectomy uh, only with, uh, with uh, stage two disease. The result of this, however, when w one pools the opinions of radiotherapists and non-radiotherapists with regard to, to uh, where we couldn't separate it out from stage, stage one and two in the opinions. In, in general, uh, stage one, uh, there's a little difference. In stage two, there's a difference, but, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's more, more people in favor of surgery for say, stage two. But when, you, when we got the data in general, we found that radiotherapists thought that, that all patients should receive radiotherapy, 19 out of 27. Non-radiotherapists, only four out of 31, thought that all patients should receive radiotherapy, and that was, was highly significant. So that here in the case, as in much of the other, in which the data are in the literature with regard to the efficacy of the therapy, and still one group, uh, who will persist in, in uh, sticking to their opinion that radiotherapy should be given. And that opinion has only begun to change a little bit with the advent of chemotherapy, but, but uh, not very, very much. Everybody knows the, the university group diabetes program and its demonstration of, of, uh, the, lack of, of the lack of efficacy of oral hypoglycemic drugs. And everybody's aware of the fact that not only were they not efficacious, but that they were accompanied by an increased rate of death uh, from the, the uh, uh, drugs, accompanying the drugs. And that the study has been roundly criticized, roundly criticized as being an inadequate, improper, not well done study. There is some difference of opinion about that. And I have personally, and with some others, long held that it's a, a good study. and. Uh, that uh, within the realms of statistical probability, it's probably true. And uh, as you may be aware, uh, when, the when the study was first reported, uh, because of the criticisms of the statistical methodology by Al Feinstein and others, the NIH appointed a peer review committee from the Biometric Society, and they spent two years reviewing the statistics and concluded that the study was, was uh, not at fault, not faulty. And then the, the cries of outrage changed to accusations of falsification of the data between its gathering at the clinics and the arrival at the statistical center, and therefore the biometric society couldn't have picked that up. And as a result of those uh, cries of outrage, why the, the Food and Drug Administration conducted a regular audit, uh, one of the audits they do for fraud, looking for falsification of data, looking for mistakes, which might have been purposeful. And uh, they went to the clinics and looked at the patients, the random selection of the patients' charts, then back to the statistical center and looked at how the data were recorded. And although they found a 10 to 15 percent minor error rate, which is understandable when they were looking at total sample of millions of data collected, actually when they corrected for the errors they found, the, the picture against the drugs was even worse. And uh, not statistically significantly worse, but even worse. 
that report is, has uh, never sort of received wide notation because there wasn't any uh, group of people to republish it broadly. But there is, uh, it did seem a possibility that there might be some uh, bias in the interpretation of the study which led us to examine uh, the sources of research support by the, the experts who were writing uh, on uh, the efficacy or lack thereof of the drugs. And uh, we're using the same technique. We classified uh, review articles as being in favor of the drugs or against them. And then we went back uh, and pulled all, by means of Medline, pulled all of the papers published by these opinion makers and looked at the front page to see who uh, was thanked for financial support. And uh, we found the following uh, data. We found that, that uh, there were uh, 73 uh, people who had received support by, in their research, 73 papers, rather, that acknowledged support in research by the manufacturers of oral hypoglycemic agents, 1,183 that did not. And then when we looked at the distribution of these, we found that, that uh, there was a highly statistically significant difference. There was an association, a clear-cut, unequivocal association between previous support of research, usually previous, some after, and the writing in the literature of an opinion about the efficacy of the drugs. Now, we don't know, uh, as with all associations, we don't know whether people wrote review articles praising the drugs and condemning the study, and it was mainly condemning the study, uh, because they had received or were about to receive support from the drug companies that made the drugs, or we don't know whether the drug companies sought out to give their money to the people who had clearly indicated that they uh, supported the, the, uh, the use of the drugs. But, uh, and that we, one can't ever come up with that answer. All we can say is that there is an association, and therefore a, there is a bias of one kind or another in the, in the process. When we looked at just the total number of authors, we didn't see the striking association, and I think the explanation uh, may be that, that what happened was that the, the, uh, the people who were in favor of the drugs wrote more articles per, per author uh, crediting the drug company, and uh, so that the difference came out as, uh, as highly significant with regard to the authors, but with regard to the total number of papers, but not uh, in the authors, with the authors. Now, there was one other kind of bias that might come into the use of oral hypoglycemic agents, and I'm dwelling on this because I think it's a good text to the problem which I, which I wanted to raise. And, uh, and that uh, comes from the fact that if a doctor now wants to do a randomized controlled trial to find out whether the UGDP was right or not, the uh, getting it, the study past the ethical review committees is going to be difficult because of the strong feelings of all clinicians on one way or the other, and the feeling of one group that it would be bad for the controls to be deprived of the drugs, and the feeling of the other group that it would be bad for the treated patients to be given these drugs that have been shown to be lethal. But also, the informed consent would be impossible, because it would have to say that a study has been done which showed that, that uh, these drugs are accompanied by a statistic, highly statistically significant increase in death from cardiovascular disease among the patients who received the drugs when compared with those who received placebo, and now because we don't believe the study, we want to do another one. We want you to volunteer to take a 50-50 chance of getting the drug which has been associated with a higher death rate in the only large-scale controlled trial. And obviously that kind of informed consent would be pretty impossible to get, but what does the doctor do when he prescribes the drug? He says, gee, you've got diabetes. Here's a prescription for you, and, and uh, take these pills and you'll be better. And uh, when the patient comes in with still uh, urine, sugar in his urine, and after obtaining a blood sugar, the doctor may well say, have you been taking your pills? And the patient will say, well, not, not very well, doctor. And then the patient will be urged to take his pills more vigorously. And uh, ignoring the fact that in the UGDP study, when the patients were dichotomized into those who took their pills and those who didn't, that the difference in death rate between treated and control was larger in the compliant patients who took their pills, in contrast to a lot of other studies, than it was in the non-compliant patients who didn't take their pills. 
And, uh, and yet, we, the doctors who use the pills push them on the basis that they uh, are helpful. Now, how did everybody get this idea? How do we, how do we have a, uh, a study which, which uh, uh, seems to be pretty good and uh, which has one conclusion which is diametrically opposite from the practice of most physicians? And in times when I've talked about the UGDP at rounds or conferences and asked how many people thought it was a bad study and practically everybody would raise their hands and I'd ask how many people had read the study and one or two people would raise their hands. Where did they get this opinion from? And that's in the last slide. What we did here was to take three throwaway journals, which are popularly read, um, and to review uh, and, and have several people review the articles to, to, uh, without knowing which journal they came from, although they certainly could draw a suspicion since we're only dealing with three journals, and classify those articles in those throwaway journals as in, in favor of the UGDP, having no opinion but just talking about it, or against the UGDP. And, uh, uh, and, there were, and we did three time periods of four months each in three one-year spans. Uh, they were times when there was a particular amount of, of public discussion of the UGDP. And we found there were 74 articles in the throwaway journals. And uh, we found that, that uh, journal number one and journal number two were in general sort of split. Some of them thought the study was good, one, two articles saying it was bad but the majority of articles saying it was equivocal. But journal number three, 47 percent of the articles were against 51 art 57 articles written on the UGDP, 47 of them criticizing the drugs and, and criticizing the study. And those of you who remember know what journal I'm talking about. We remember seeing blatant headlines talking about fraud and all sorts of terrible things that had gone on uh, in the study. First, that it was statistically flawed, and then after the conclusion that it wasn't, why then the accusations of fraud. And here, as you can see, a, a certain amount of bias. Now, if you look at this column, this is the, the uh, percent of advertising space in those three journals on those same times uh, paid for by the manufacturers of the oral hypoglycemic agents, 35 percent, 47 percent in the two others, and 79 percent in the third. Now, here again, there's evidence of an association. Uh, one can't tell whether the pharmaceutical firms advertised in the journals because they opposed the drugs or whether they opposed the drugs because they got advertisements from the pharmaceutical companies that made the drugs. One can only say that there is a highly statistically significant association. There may be some third explanation which we don't know. I think we have the lights now. But at any rate, it does uh, reveal, I think, that uh, all of these data you can turn the lights on. <coughs> uh, all these data do reveal that there is are sources of bias in medical care uh, other than that exhibited by people who want to do randomized controlled trials, and yet the only instance in which we have uh, informed consent uh, of the kind that we have is for the randomized trials. <coughs> One other uh, example to give you of that problem, uh, I've often argued with people about randomizing the first patient because it seems to me that once the uh, endpoint that one is after is efficacy, that one owes the early patients a chance to fall at chance, to, to be uh, assigned by random chance to either therapy because one doesn't know which one is best. And if I can use the surgical example because it's more dramatic, the surgeons I've argued with have said, well, we can't do that because we may have an idea for a good operation, let's say a specific instance of a new way of doing portocable shunt surgery. And uh, how can I do a randomized controlled trial when it's going to take me 10 to 20 patients to work out the operation? And that would be unfair. So that what I've done is a 10 or 20 patients to be sure that the operation was good. And in the case of selective shunts, I think the mortality rate was about 80 percent in the first 10. Uh, and then only after I've worked out the bugs and have the mortality rate down to a reasonable level can I then uh, put the patient in a randomized controlled trial. Because if I started the randomized controlled trial with the first patient, I'd have to stop the trial uh, after the first 10 patients. If the operation was, was had a higher death rate than normal, significantly higher death rate than normal. And that's interesting logic, and I think in dealing with animals it's great. But in dealing with patients, uh, 
the problem of informed consent comes up. That uh, is it possible for the surgeon to say to the first 10 patients, I've devised a new operation uh, which I would like to try on you. It may be better than the standard uh, or it may be worse. Ordinarily, we do a randomized controlled trial and give you a 50-50 chance of getting into the better uh, therapeutic group, but I'm not going to do that in your case because I haven't worked out the therapy well enough yet, and I don't want to take a chance on starting a trial when the death rate may be too high in the first 10 patients, and therefore I'd like you to volunteer, uh, and this is informed consent, to be one of the first 10 patients in which I work out the operation. And then after I've done that, we will conduct a randomized controlled trial. And obviously, uh, that's never been tried. And, uh, and never could be tried. And yet, if the doctor were doing a randomized controlled trial from the beginning, uh, I think he would, he would have to say that I don't know whether the death rate's going to be higher or lower than the standard therapy. It could be that we'll luck out and it'll be better. And uh, in which case, if you get the new therapy, you'll be lucky. And if you get the standard therapy, you won't be getting quite as good therapy. But at least the patient will know what his risk, relative risks are. And, uh, and I think more often, consent to what would be a more, more proper study. So aside from the, from the statistical and, and uh, scientific aspects of randomizing from the beginning, uh, which are epitomized by the fact that most people don't like to do a randomized trial after they've done the selected initial study because they gain opinions one way or the other from that, aside from those reasons, there are strong ethical reasons for randomizing from the first. But it means, it means employing an informed consent procedure which is the same for initial therapies, whether or not randomization takes place or not. And it also implies that informed consent should be a little more detailed and, and uh, uh, explicit in, in, uh, in all therapies, recognizing the fact, the whole other subject, that most patients don't listen anyway and will do anything their doctor wants them to do. Well, that. Uh, concludes uh, my presentation. I'll be glad to answer some questions. In summary, I've I'll stay here and be glad to argue with anybody. I think the newer agents should be tested against a placebo to find out uh, whether they're accompanied by a higher or lower or the same death rate from cardiovascular disease before they're released to the market. I think so, but I think one can say that the reason for introducing these new drugs is that they are smaller dose and may not have that side effect and may have the desirable anti-diabetic effect, which we know they have from animals, and, uh, and therefore we think that it's worthwhile taking the risk, and you'll be better off if they, uh, if they work and don't cause the, the, uh, the bad side effects. I think patients could be persuaded to consent. Yep. Probably requires a certain degree of judgment, uh, you decide whether to assign a study, either to blindly randomize or the unblindly I'm glad you asked that question because the first time, the first go round, uh, we didn't pick that up. And then as we looked at the data, we thought, my God, you know? <laughs> So we redid them all, and we redid them with, in which we looked at, at first looked at the data and recorded that, and then we looked at the blinding method and recorded that, each of them having been blotted out in the copy that we looked at. 
And we didn't actually find, uh, we found a few errors, but I don't think any real, we found no, I think, Henry, no evidence of, is Henry Sachs, yes, do we, I think we found no evidence of bias, but, but it was a nice experiment, and, and uh, we thought of it, uh, thank God, and before the presentation. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know the data. It would be kind of hard to, to get a decent denominators for that uh, question. And, uh, but it, as I remember the data, it looked like they were about, the papers were about evenly distributed. Uh, you see, any time they fell into the group of, that a, a lot of surgery was going on, any time we found a report of surgery. Uh, and then if we found no report of surgery from that unit, it was the non-group. And without knowledge of the denominators, I think it would be hard to say. Yeah, but they might also be more critical articles if they weren't doing so well. We know from unpublished data that some institutions that have done large numbers of coronary artery surgery have had horrendous death rates, and uh, uh, 12, 15 percent in 1979 when the last time I saw the data. 76 was the last time I saw the data. Uh, and, and it's undoubtedly very much better now. But, but it may well be that some of the papers were written from those places saying the study, saying the operation may not be so good, but the report of the mortality rates never got out because they were so high that nobody wanted to write them. I wonder if you would uh, comment on uh, the way the advised, uh, the uh, form consent uh, is obtained from the patient, specifically whether it must be written out, the patient must read it and sign it, or whether it can be verbally transmitted to the patient with appropriate witnesses and what the risks are of these two alternatives. Well, I, I believe in the system used here, uh, which is that although the writing is there and available and goes in the record, the, uh, the patient signs that it's been explained to them and, and they agree. It's available for them to read if they want to, but they're not said here, you've got to read this. Well, do you uh, think that in the process of explaining something verbally, uh, which is more or less uh, contains the content that has been approved by the local committee, that in the process, if someone has some interests in this that, and is interested in pushing the study for purposes of continuing his research support, that he's pushing people into some of these? Oh, absolutely. Just, just like the, when the surgeon sees somebody with a belly and decides he wants to be operated on, he urges that patient to be operated on. Same bias. Do you think that uh, these patients are always as informed about it as they... I think that the research patients are much more informed than the ordinary practice patients. Much more. I don't know whether uh, anyone has seen uh, Franz Engelfinger's television tape five, or read his five minutes on informed consent. It's a, it's a very edifying, what he says is that I'm, a, I'm the most informed doctor in the world about medicine and yet when I got my cancer of the stomach, one doctor said this, one said that, another said that, and I finally uh, came to the realization that, that the thing to do was not to bother me with those details, but just have a doctor and I say to that doctor, you make the decision. Now you, you make the decision and I'll do what you say. Choose a good doctor and don't ask for informed consent and take it from someone who should know is what he says. Well, this is very relevant the to the has moved out. Yep. This is very relevant to the point that I was making and, and uh, first with regard to knowing the therapy, I, I think in, in studies in which the endpoint is rel relatively objective, we overdo double blinding of the therapy. What's, it, what's essential is blinding of the randomization. 
but once that's done, I think that the blinding of therapy is not that important since it's broken quite often by side effects and other things. So that, so that patients, one can design a study in which the patient will know what they're getting. They just won't know how the decision, they just won't know, they'll know it's at random, but they just won't be in on the decision. Now, it's absolutely clear that patients in randomized control trials are very different from the population as a whole for many reasons, among them that they have to go through this rigmarole of being selected for a study and being the kind of patient that's likely to consent, whereas others might not. And the data we have on that suggests that in some studies, such as some of the newer anti-hypertensive drug studies, about 3% of the patients available to an institution with high blood pressure who would ordinarily just on paper, just on saying the patient is here and has high blood pressure, only 3% get in the trials. Some of them are for obvious reasons that are outlined in the protocol, that, that, uh, and some of them are for subtle reasons that one can't detect from the protocol. But you're, you're absolutely right, and the only way to my mind that we can correct that is to start randomizing everybody. And uh, as soon as we get to that stage where in the instance in which we do not know which therapy is better, mind you, that's critical, we don't know which therapy is better, then uh, it's better to randomize from the beginning. And the reason we get into this position we're in so often now is that we don't randomize in the beginning, but we start using a therapy and then we draw a conclusion which may be invalid, as a lot of these data show, that either the therapy is better or worse than the standard therapy, so it's either pushed on everybody or it's abandoned, and by that time it's unethical to do the randomized trial. Uh, but I always am upset by people saying that, that the control group of a randomized control study is a good natural history of the disease. It's an unnatural history of the disease because the control group are a highly selected, quite different group of people. Bernie? Well, I've been associated in the last 10 years with about 10 large-scale randomized trials, some of them involving elaborate operations. One uh, going on now, in which I'm chairman of the Data Monitoring Committee, the POSH study, the Program for the Surgical Correction of Hyperlipidemia. There, the patients have to be in the hospital for three days. They have to have an a cardiac catheterization and angiography performed, and then they, they uh, get informed consent and they get randomized and they get a, a uh, ileal bypass operation and they get terrible diarrhea and hemorrhoids, as from the previous data, I'm not giving away secrets, and, uh, uh, and they go through an awful lot for research to compare the, the uh, outcome, the death rate in the future from cardiovascular disease or not in these groups with the control group. There's the, the uh, Paris study in which they're taking aspirin or persantine or both for three years. Uh, there are innumerable studies like that in which I would guess, well, if you count the coronary drug study, uh, 30,000 people, 40,000 people have been involved. I have yet to hear, I have yet to hear of a malpractice suit associated with any one of the studies that I've been working with. I have never heard of one. And I think Dr. Kupfer will confirm the fact that in the experience at Mount Sinai, that the number of malpractice suits associated with research, well, he's holding up a big fat zero. Uh, and yet, we do have a few malpractice suits here, 80 to 100 a year, for non-research. Now, it may very well be that, that we have 80 times as many patients coming through Mount Sinai for non-research as we do for research, but the, I'm absolutely convinced, uh, without being able to prove it, that the um, malpractice suit rate in research is less than that in practice because the research requires the doctor to spend so much time sitting down with the patient and explaining what's going on. So much more time than they ordinarily use in practice, and I think that's the way one avoids malpractice suits. We have time for one more question. Sherman? Part of 
Henry Sachs reminded me that I had to give a talk to the clinical pharmacology sessions this year in a month or two, and that it was on randomized controlled trials and not to show everything tonight, so I wouldn't have anything left to show then in case some of the same people were there. And I decided to talk at that time about ethics and the decision-making process and when to end the study, and at which we have some fair amount of data. And uh, uh, so I, I'll say uh, tune in again at the clinical pharmacology sessions, which I forget when they are, Wednesday afternoons or Thursday. Thursday. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Chalmers, for uh